Thank you for checking out this video. Our prayer is, is that this video helps us fulfill our mission of helping those that are far from God become committed followers of Christ all the way from the scenic city to the nations. While we think that this uh, video is a blessing, we don't want it to be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering together of saints and covenant community with other believers, other followers of Christ in a local body of believers in a church is what God created us and designed us to be, one body together. And so we pray this video will be a blessing to you. We pray it encourages you. We pray it challenges you, brings you closer to Jesus. But we don't want it to be a replacement for church. And so we encourage you to uh, go to a church that's close to you. And we would love for you to join us at Brainerd Baptist the next opportunity that you have. It has been a fun week at Brainerd Baptist Church this week. It seems like every week I get up here and I say, oh, there's so much happening. There's so much happening uh, at our church, in our church family. We're thankful that you're here, thankful that you're part of it. Just so you guys kind of have a heads up for what's uh, coming soon. Um, on Thursday, we had a full day of basically our sent ones that have been all over the world and the Lord and his providence kind of has a whole bunch of them cycling back in. And so over the next few weeks, please be on the lookout for folks that you see in these videos and pat them on the back and take them to Chick-fil-A. That's the appropriate uh, thing to do whenever they've been out of the country for, for such a long time. We're happy to have them back. Um, today is also promotion Sunday. So did, is there anyone in here who promoted today? I know there were more than two of you, three or four of you. So today is a fun day at Brainerd Baptist because every one of our kids moved up a grade level in their life group. All of our students moved up. Some of our kids moved to students, which is kind of an interesting, traumatic, fun event. And, um, and so there's just lots of really good stuff happening. Uh, we're in a season right now of fresh starts. It's happening at our church. It's happening um, in schools as school starts back. I, I love new things and I love restarting old things. Uh, just so you know my personality, I'm the person who finds such great satisfaction when you open a book for the first time and you just feel the pages like kind of... I love that. That is the kind of person I am. I loved when I was in school. I loved walking into a new classroom for the first time. I loved when I was promoting at church. This is this start of a new school, the start of a new church year, all these new fresh things starting. It just, it just feels fresh and fun and exciting and uh, it's appropriate then that we start a new series uh, today. We're going to be in Second Peter, uh, studying through this book. It's appropriate to start a new book on a day like today. Uh, Peter is someone that all of you should be familiar with. If you think back as we work through the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark together, Peter was the loudest and the proudest of all of the disciples. We talked about how Peter uh, was restored after he denied Jesus and then how he led the church as it was established and then led it in its first few steps in the infancy of the church going out on mission. Most recently, we finished a, ser a sermon series in 1 Peter where Peter wrote to churches that were spread out. They were living in a context that was hostile to them. And, and Peter writes to these churches asking them, challenging them to live as missional exiles, exiles with a purpose, a purpose of being on mission for the Lord. Today, we will turn to 2 Peter and we'll visit our old friend again. This will be the last time that we'll hear from, from Peter in the scripture is this letter to 2 Peter, and we'll talk about that more. So if you have your Bible, I would ask that you open it up. If you didn't bring a Bible or you need a Bible, they're either in the back or just outside the back. I encourage you to grab that next week uh, if you... Uh, don't mind. I like to preach with, to people with their Bibles open, so uh, no pressure, but I'd love for you to bring your Bible. If you're looking for, for, for Second Peter, here's how you find it. You turn to the back, you find maps, you start turning backwards, you find Revelation, 3rd, 2nd, 1st, John, you'll probably skip over Jude that was mixed in there, and then you land at 2nd Peter. And so if you would, join me in 2nd Peter, and what we're going to see as this letter begins is we're going to see the introductions to the reader. 2 Peter, chapter number one, verse number one. It says, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. The first question that we should ask anytime that we start a new book, anytime we are going through our quiet time and we begin to read something new is we need to ask the question, who wrote this book? If you uh, look in a study Bible or a commentary, you'll find that Bible scholars, they love to debate about who it was that actually wrote the book. Well, here's a hint for you as you begin to do that. The most obvious answer is probably the right answer. The most obvious answer is probably generally the right answer. Peter is the author of 2 Peter. It comes as a surprise to most of you, I know. Peter begins this letter by introducing himself. And when he introduces himself, he introduces himself as Simeon Peter. He says, by that introduction, I am the author. But you'll notice, for those of you who've read in other places of Scripture, that Simeon Peter is not the way that Peter is normally introduced in Scripture. Generally, he's called Simon Peter. Other times, he's called Cephas. It's very rare to see this word, Simeon, used. And so for clarity, as we begin, we're going to start off looking at and thinking about just Simon Peter, Simeon Peter, why he introduces himself this way. I want to explain to you why Peter's name is so complicated. First, uh, Peter's name in Aramaic, Peter, is Cephas. This may have actually been the first name that Jesus gave to Peter that came out of his lips when they met on the shore and they met for the first time and Jesus looked at him and he said, you're Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas. Peter, on the other hand, is a Greek translation of that word name, Cephas, which means rock. Peter would be the rock. His statement of faith of who Jesus was would be the rock on which the church would be built. And Simon is the Greek translation of the name that Peter's mom called him. You see, in Hebrew, Simon is Simeon. There's maybe no better reason for believing that 2 Peter was written by Peter than this introduction. Peter introduces himself the same way that his mom would have introduced him if she would have met you on the street. He introduced himself as Simeon Peter. Now, it goes on and Peter says then, Simeon Peter, I am a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is who I am. Here's the way that my mom called me. Here's what Jesus named me. I'm a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Introductions are interesting, are they? Aren't they? When you walked in today, when you shook someone's hand that you didn't come with, you probably introduced yourself some way and said something to the effect, "Hi, I'm Bill. I'm a lawyer at X and X firm." Uh, It's nice to meet you. My name's Sally. I do graphic design from home so I can be with my kiddos. My name's Jessica, a younger lady. I got engaged to Matt over there. I'm really in love with him. Maybe you talked to me and I introduced myself. I said, I'm Kevin. This is my wife, Laura. I'm a pastor at Brainerd Baptist Church. We share what's most important to us when we introduce ourselves. And we also share what we think is important to the people that we're introducing ourselves to. We, want, we share what we want them to know about us. And that's what Peter does here in his introduction. He says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. The Greek word here is probably translated best as a slave or a bond servant. Peter says in general, my name's Simeon Peter. I belong and serve Jesus Christ. This is who Peter is. This is who this person who will be writing this book that we're going to be studying for the next several weeks, this is who he is. He is someone who belongs to and serves Jesus Christ. It's the most important characteristic for him and that he wants others to know about him. We've known Peter all along the timeline of his time in Scripture. We know him when he first met Jesus. We know and watched and learned about the bold, brash disciple. Then we watched the fallen favorite as he denied Jesus. We saw as the fallen favorite was redeemed and made a, a shepherd. We saw him become a pastor and a father, a father to the church. We saw him love the church as it expanded out on mission. We know all about Peter. But the Peter that we learn about and we meet in 2 Peter is an older, more mature Peter. 
He's a Peter who is more spiritually mature than where he was when he was accustomed to sticking his foot in his mouth every time that he talked to Jesus. This Peter is a servant of Jesus Christ, his Savior and his Lord. That is all that he cares that you know about him. That's who he is. Peter's also using language here when he talks about, when he uses the word servant, because he will warn his audience about others who are servants and slaves to their sinful desires. He's going to warn the church that there are those out there who are slaves and they're worming their way in. They're trying to get into the church because of their own sinful desires rather than being servants and followers of Jesus. Now, Peter's writing this letter just before his death in A.D. 68. That was when that king, that evil king, Nero, uh, that we heard about in 1 Peter, we heard that he was in 1 Peter ramping up his ability and desire to persecute the church. Well, by 68, when this letter is written, Nero's reign of terror over the Roman Empire has already begun. It is in full full, uh, blossom Peter will be taken and crucified soon. He'll be crucified upside down because he says that he's not worthy to be killed the same way that his Savior was killed. He knows that his life is coming to an end. That's how he begins writing this letter. In verse 14 of chapter 1, Peter says, I know that I will soon lay aside my tent, his body, as our Lord Jesus Christ has indeed made clear to me. Peter knows The end is coming, and he has a message that he wants to communicate. He will do that humbly. Remember, he said, I'm a servant. But he also wants to remind those that he's writing to that he's a little bit more than a servant. He's also writing as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Jesus has given Peter the authority to speak as a leader. He's given him the authority to be the spokesman, not just of a king, but of the king of kings. When Peter writes, he writes in his own humility, but he also writes with the authority of the God of all creation has given him to write this letter. Now, there's no, as we think about who Peter is, Simeon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, we know who he is. So who are the people that Peter is writing to? Peter doesn't name a specific audience in this letter. There's no city named. History doesn't help us either. We don't know exactly. There's no one who knows exactly who his audience is. There's a reference when we get to chapter 3 that you'll find where that references back to other letters that Peter's written the church. But so that you guys know, our apostles, they wrote letters to lots of churches. All of those letters weren't accepted as being God-inspired. So we don't know if that was just another letter or whatever. We have no idea who the audience is. Here's what Peter does tell us about this letter. We think that it is a specific church or a specific group of churches And here's what he wants us to know about them, about the audience to the letter. To those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who's Peter writing to? He's writing to fellow believers who've received faith equal to his through the righteous sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Peter's addressing believers And he wants to communicate a few things to them, even as he begins describing who he's writing to. He says the word, the word received here is all, it can mean that it's, it's also translated in Greek. It means that you received it by lot. If you'll remember the disciples did this, they cast lots to find out who would fill in, who would be the next disciple after Judas's betrayal. But that doesn't mean that salvation comes to these people or us by random selection. What it does mean is that salvation is not earned. Salvation is given to us as a gift. It comes through grace, through the righteous sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's been given to us. Peter's audience has been saved by grace. And because everyone is saved through the same sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus who died on a cross in his righteousness for our sins, all of our faith is equal. It was the same sacrifice. That's an amazing statement. Peter says this, his audience, those that were listening to him, among them were both Hebrew and and Gentiles. 
These people who are listening were, the Jews who were listening were told their entire lives, you're chosen, you're special. While the people who were sitting next to them, the Gentiles were not. Now, as Peter begins his letter, what he says to them is that those that were once special and chosen are still special and chosen, but now their faith, their salvation is no different than the salvation of those who were previously not special, not chosen. You see, the cost of saving a person from one ethnicity is the same cost that it, co- that it costs us to save, that costs Jesus to save someone from another ethnicity. The cost of saving a male is the same cost as saving a female. A child's faith and an adult's faith comes at the exact same cost. The cost of a righteous, perfect Savior who died on a cross for our sins and that sacrifice was enough and sufficient to cover all of our sins. Peter's also saying here that the faith of every follower of Jesus It's equal to that of the apostles. That's another amazing statement. Our giftings, our responsibilities, our roles may all be different, but our faith is the same. We have the same faith as Peter. Think about that. Peter was the guy who walked on water. He was the guy who went up on the mountain and saw Jesus transfigured. He was the one who saw all of those miracles done. He did mighty works for the Lord. And Peter says, our faith is equal to his faith because the faith that we have comes from the righteousness of God. So now we know who the author is. We know who the audience is. The introductions to the reader are complete. So why is Peter writing this letter? What is his motivation? Let's look back at verse number two. Peter writes, may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and and of Jesus our Lord. Peter's motivation for writing this letter is extremely important for us to understand as we begin studying this book. As we've mentioned earlier, Peter knows that evil Nero will soon take his life. And as Peter sits down to write to these churches, there are some things that are on his mind. There are some things that he's thinking back about. He looks back about when he was called and thinks about his ministry. He thinks about walking with Jesus, all the things that he saw and all the things that he heard. He thinks about the miracles that he saw. He remembers the failures that he had as he denied Jesus. He thinks about how Jesus came to him and they walked along the beach and he restored him and how he called him to be a shepherd. He thinks about the sheep that Jesus gave him to shepherd and these churches spread out on mission. He looks around, he thinks about where he is, he thinks about what the Lord has done in his ministry and on his mission. He sees the threat that is on the horizon. You see, he knows that The churches that are out there, they're young and they're immature. And there's a threat of false teachers worming their way into these faith families. He's a shepherd and he's watching the sheep. In the shadows lurking, he knows that there are wolves waiting for him to doze off, to go to sleep so that they can take his flock. As Peter prepares to end his ministry and to go, with the be, go to be with the Lord, he has one final plea that comes in 2 Peter for that church that he loves. He wants them to persevere. He wants them to last. He wants them to have a legacy, and he wants that legacy to continue. He wants those young believers to mature and to grow He wants the church that he loves, those sheep that the Lord has called and sent out on mission. He wants them to last. He wants them to be found righteous. He wants them to multiply. We see that as Peter closes the letter in verses 14 and 17 of chapter 3. As he closes the letter, he says, Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight, at peace. Peter's desire for these churches is that when Christ returns or when they are called home, that they will be without blemish, they will be righteous. And then in verse 17, he writes again, dear friends, since you know this in advance, 
since you know that there are those who are wolves, who are false teachers, be on guard so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people and fall from your own stable position. He wants this church not to fall away. He wants them to rely on the stable truth that he's found in in letters like this one, in the gospels, in God's word. That's his motivation, that they are righteous and that they are stable, that they continue on in their mission, that the church that he has established and invested in would continue in those two pathways, even after he's gone. Peter wants them to be uncompromisingly committed to the faith they have been given and challenged to carry on. He says to them in verse number two, again, may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. May it be multiplied. May you know grace. May you know peace. May it multiply among you. The multiplication of God's grace is that people in the church would truly know that saving grace that Peter's talking about. And not only them, but that as they grow in their knowledge and obedience, that they would seek to share the gospel and disciple others. May grace multiply among you. And then Peter says, he also prays that peace would be multiplied among them. Peace comes from being in right standing with God, being righteous before God under Jesus' sacrifice and living in holiness, being sanctified, being found without spot or blemish in God's sight. And Peter emphasizes from where that grace and that peace originate, the source of, that w- the source of their multiplication. Look back at verse number two. The source of the multiplication, the source of the grace and peace They come through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. That's a really important phrase. The source of their multiplication, the source of grace, the source of peace is through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Now, I'm going to bore you today with some uh, Greek stuff. And so for those of you that aren't in the language, um, I'm sorry, just forgive me. We won't do this often, but there are lots of words here today that are kind of important. Two words in the New Testament can be translated as knowledge. Okay, so that's an important word because that's where grace and peace comes from. It comes through knowledge of our Lord. The first word, the first way that you can translate knowledge is gnosis. It's the, most common, it's the most common word. Peter will use it later in the book. It means good sense. It means practical wisdom. But that's not the word that Peter uses here. If you want to know grace and peace, you know it through wisdom, as Peter says, epigenosis, hypergenosis. This type of knowledge is more than intellectual knowledge. It's more than good sense. It's more than practical wisdom. It is the deepest, most intimate type of knowledge possible. Do you want grace and peace? Do you want that? It comes through deep relational knowledge of God. That type of knowledge of God will bring grace. It will bring salvation. It will bring peace. It will put you in right standing with God and it will be multiplied with you. It will be multiplied among you and among your church family. The idea here is almost the same idea as a husband and wife when they know one another. But it's more than their knowledge of each other physically. It's the type of knowledge that comes from a marriage relationship that lasts decade after decade after decade. If you want to know grace and peace, you have to know the Lord in a deep, relational, intimate way. Peter's motivation for the church to persevere, to be firmly established, to grow and to expand is dependent upon the church's intimate, intentional, relational knowledge of God and Jesus, our, Jesus the Lord. And so what does that mean? How does that apply to what Peter is saying in these first few lines of his letter? That brings us to verses three and four, the main idea and application for his audience. Look back at verses number three and verse number four. He is talking about God. God's divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. 
By these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. The main idea of today's passage, the main idea that Peter is trying to transmit as this letter begins is that Jesus has provided everything Jesus has provided everything that we need to grow in his likeness as we wait for his return. Jesus has given us everything that we need to grow and to be more like him as we wait for Jesus' return. Has anyone in this room ever been guilty of saying, I can't do that? I can't do that, Lord. I could never do that thing that you're calling me to do. I could never go to that place, Lord, that you're calling me to go to. I could never give up this thing, Lord, that you're calling me to give up. Has anyone ever said that? I know I have. There have been times in my life when I've said, I I, I don't think I can do that. Well, those statements are statements from defeated believers. They're statements that come from a defeated church. They're statements of a church that won't last, a church that definitely won't fulfill their mission in the world. Hear Peter's words. If you've said those words, if you said, I don't think I can do that, Lord. I don't think I can go there. I don't think I can give that thing up. Peter says God's divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. We have, if you are a follower of Jesus, everything that you need to do what he has called you to do. That is good news. He doesn't call us and not resource us. He doesn't call us and not empower us. He gives us what we need to do what he calls us to do. As we think back to those statements of I can't do this, I can't do that. Of course you can't do that. Of course you can't go there. Of course you can't give that thing up in your own power. But followers of Christ, we don't live in our own power. We live in God's divine power. That power that comes from the Lord allows us to do those things. The power has been given to us. Everything required for life and for godliness It's that power that allows us as followers of Jesus to live radically and to live sacrificially, to live in a way that the world doesn't understand, to make big, big challenges, to go after big things for our Lord, to live in a way that brings him great glory because we believe that God will provide us with his divine power to do whatever he calls us to do, whenever he calls us to do it. The word power here, another Greek word, sorry, is dunamis. It's the word in the English language where dynamite finds its origin. There are lots of pastors who give really good illustrations about uh, dynamite and the Lord. But in reality, what this power means is not dynamite power. Dynamite is power that blows up one time and then it's all over and you go in and clean out the mess that it made. The power that Peter's talking about here is power that doesn't just make a big bang and then it's over. It is an ongoing, inexhaustible power, a power that is without limits and without limitations. That's the kind of power that Peter says that God has given you to do what he's called you to do. It's that kind of power that's been given to us so that we can live our lives and glorify God. It's that kind of power that allows us to be Christ-like and to live godly lives. Everything that you need to live like Christ and to fulfill what he has called you to do is at your fingers, fingertips. It's been provided to you. It's accessible to you. Now, Peter is not talking about everything you want He's not talking about everything that you desire, but he is talking about everything required to fulfill the life purpose that you have and his mission. This leads to a natural question. Where do we find access to God's divine power? We access this power, Peter writes in these verses, through the knowledge of him. You've heard that before. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That phrase should be familiar. You heard it in verse number two. Grace and peace will be multiplied to you through knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. 
Now put those two phrases together. God's divine power has given us everything required to live like Christ through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his goodness, grace for salvation, peace in the eyes of God, and the power to do his will are all available through the knowledge of God, intimate knowledge of him, relational knowledge of him. The one who called you, he provides these things for you. He's called you by his glory and by his goodness. Verse number four emphasizes this point. Through your knowledge of the Lord, he has given. Sometimes verb tenses are important. He's given it. It is already yours. It is in your possession. It's past tense. It is secure. It is safe. You have it. You have great, great and precious promises have been given to you. You learn of these promises as you grow in your knowledge of him. You see, through your knowledge of the Lord, that deep, intimate relationship, you'll know God. You'll know him through grace that he gives you and redemption as he cleanses you. You'll know God through peace, through walking in righteousness. Through his knowledge of him, you'll know God's power required to live like Christ. Through knowledge of God, you'll know his promises Promises to provide for your needs, promises that will ultimately lead, that will ultimately come at his return when he comes and establishes his kingdom and you're part of it. As you know God in these ways, you'll share in his divine nature. That's a crazy statement, isn't it? As you know God intimately, as you walk with him, as you grow in your relationship and knowledge with him, you'll know to him today, you'll join in his divine nature by being like Christ. As you live and you are righteous, you will share in his nature and at his return, you will know his divine nature as you are glorified and brought into his presence. If you know God in this way, there's a promise. You see it at the end of verse number four. It says that we will escape the corruption that is in the world because of of your evil desires. You'll escape the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. And that's what Peter's prayer is for you and for me, that we will uncompromisingly be faithful to the Lord and be faithful to his mission. He prays that you and I, that we'll be without spot, without blemish, He prays that we will be righteous. That was his prayer as he penned these letters, that we're going to spend time hearing God's voice through Peter's pen, that we would be without spot, without blemish, that we would be righteous, that we would be stable, that we would be established when false teachers and unrighteous people seek to steer us in the wrong direction. Peter pleads with the church in this way because if they can escape the corruption of the world, their own evil desires, their itching ears, they will be established even though these false teachers and temptation comes. They will persevere through difficult times because they know the sound of their Lord's voice. They will grow and flourish as grace and peace is multiplied through them. Their grace, the gospel that they preach and that they take to the world will be pure and it will be give those same believers that they share the gospel with the same truth and stable gospel that they experience. That brings us back to the main point of our passage. Jesus has provided everything we need to grow in his likeness as we wait for his return. So how do we apply this truth today? How does this change the way that I live tomorrow? How does it change those of you that go to work, those of you that go to school? What difference does this make? Well, I was recently listening to a sermon by Herschel York, and he gave reference to this amazing news story that was really helpful to me. As it turns out, this story um, that he referenced uh, has been repeated numerous times over the past several months. Some of you computer guys will Uh, will really, uh, you'll connect with this. About 10 years ago, there was a German computer programmer who lived in San Francisco. He made a video explaining cryptocurrency 10 years back. In return for making this video explaining what cryptocurrency was, he received in payment 
7,002 Bitcoin 10 years ago. He stored, I don't even know how you do this. He stored the Bitcoin in what's called an iron key wallet. That's not a wallet that you put in your back pocket. That's a wallet that goes in a hard drive. 7,002 Bitcoin he stored in an iron key wallet on a hard drive. And he did what all of us do. He wrote down a password so that he would never forget it. And he put it on a piece of paper and he stored it somewhere. 10 years later, 7,002 Bitcoin is worth $240 million. You've probably already guessed the problem though, haven't you? That little piece of paper where he wrote the password is nowhere to be found. The Iron Key wallet, he can hold in his hands, that hard drive. It allows for 10 incorrect tries. He is 0 for 8 on password attempts. Everything that this guy would need for his life here on this planet is at the tip of his fingers. But he can't get access to it. According to news reports, there are $140 billion worth of Bitcoin that's been lost or left inaccessible in virtual wallets. Resources that you can hold the hard drive in your hand, resources that you know is in there that would change your life, but you just can't get access to it. Today, salvation for our sins, peace with God and his divine power, things that have in actuality much more eternal worth, even than that $240 million that's on that guy's hard drive, things that have much more value are right at our fingertips, but it is only accessible through knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to know peace with God, you can know it, but you can only know it through an intimate, deep relationship with the Lord. And that leads us to some practical application questions. The first one is, is do you know Jesus personally today? Do you really know him? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Have you confessed your sins? Have you repented of those sins? Have you committed yourself that you're gonna follow after Jesus as your Lord and as your savior? Have you committed yourself to be his follower no matter what? Knowledge of God begins with becoming a follower of Jesus. That's the first step to God's divine power is knowledge of God begins with becoming his follower, experiencing redemption that only he can give. But relational intimate knowledge, it's not a momentary decision. You see, our knowledge from him, has, it's an ongoing relational knowledge. It comes through an ongoing relationship, a continuing followership. At the moment that we commit to follow the Lord and we experience redemption from our sin, the Holy Spirit, he comes to dwell within us. And when he dwells within us, we have access to the living God, the password to his divine power that will allow us to share his divine nature upon his return and escape the corruption of the word. When the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we know where the piece of paper is. It is in our hand. Unfortunately, though, many of us never use the password. Many of us never access the divine power that the Lord has given us, that we have access to. We live defeated in this world. We live defeated by temptation because we never access God's power. We try to live our lives in our own power. Today, we live in a country and speak a language where access to God's living, inspired word is more easily accessed than any other place on planet Earth. 
and any and it is more accessible than at any other moment in history. You live in a place where you have more access to God's powerful word than you've ever than has ever existed in all of history. You live in that place. At Brainerd, our, we are a part of a church family that's committed to helping us not just have access, but to understand God's word, to grow in our knowledge of God's word, to grow in our obedience to God's word. You can hear God's word preached weekly. We have life groups for every age and almost any day of the week. We offer classes throughout the week and ministries that help you grow in your understanding of God's word. Through life groups and other relationships in our church, you can meet with others who will hold you accountable and who will help you apply God's word to your day-to-day life. We offer opportunities at Brainerd Baptist Church for you to serve and to use the gift that God's given you so that you can put God's divine power into action. And you can do that all the way from driving a golf cart here to going to the other side of the planet. The question that we have to answer is, are we accessing the divine power of our Lord or have we put the piece of paper in the pa- with the password somewhere that we won't lose it? And then we lose it. Today, the Lord has given us everything that we need to do exactly anything, anything that he calls us to do. Are we willing to do it? Are we accessing the divine power of the Lord or have we hidden and lost that word? You access God's divine power in your life to overcome sin, to persevere and to do what God calls you to do through knowledge of of God. He's provided it all. Are you using what he has provided you? Have you committed to follow Jesus as Lord? If not, don't let this day pass you by. All you have to do is confess your sin, repent of your sin, and follow after Jesus. Are you growing in an ongoing relationship with the Lord? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to guide your life? Do you listen to his voice? Do you pray to the Lord that he would show you what he wants you to do? Are you reading God's word and are you committed to obeying what God's word commands? Is it a daily moment by moment commitment that you have to understand God's word or are you just accessing God's divine power in his word occasionally or when you are desperate? Are you actively participating in the life of your church family? That may mean today that someone who's been with us for a long time needs to join our church family and become a committed covenant member. It may mean that someone needs to join a life group. It may mean that you need to begin giving of your resources to the Lord. It may mean that you need to serve in some way. We need you, the Lord needs you to use his divine power to connect with your church. Listen, if you want to, if you If you want to grow in your walk with the Lord, if you want to live in his divine power, if that's something that you claim today, it will show in how committed you are to your church family. It shows in church attendance. It shows in life group participation. It shows in how you serve. It shows in other ministries of our church. Are you you accessing the power of the Lord? Assess your life. Is God's power locked up in an iron key wallet? Are you using the password? Are you using what the Lord has given you? My prayer for you today is that you would grow in your knowledge of the Lord. If you don't know him today, if you've never made that first step, I pray that you become a follower of Jesus today. But if you do know him and you continue to fall fall into temptation, you continue to live in your own power, and it's just not working. What Peter wants you to hear as we begin this book is that Jesus has provided everything. He's provided everything that we need to grow in his likeness as we wait for his return. Will you access his divine power or will you leave it locked up?